So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we're looking at reformulating cosmetics but particularly looking at sun protection products. Um, so I'm joined today by Macon from MW Innovations um, and I'll be getting him to introduce himself a, a little bit. Um, but just to let you know the webinar is being recorded and I'll be sending out the recording after the webinar. Um, we're also going to have a question and answer at the end um, so please feel free to write some Q&As as we go along. There's a little Q&A box, but also feel free to use the chat function. We've got a nice good audience today. Um, so if you've got anything you want to share and you want to discuss with other audience members, mm -hmm. please do use that. And then towards the end, me and make on more review and we'll kind of answer the questions that you put in there as well. So me and Macon are going to kind of have a bit of a webinar series coming up where we'll be looking at uh, reformulating cosmetics in particular, um, as Macon is, as he'll tell you later, an expert in cosmetic formulation. Um, and we're really looking at the testing side as well. Um, so we're kicking off with sun protection. So we'll be looking at the sun care market today. We'll be looking at what can instigate a new formulation for sun protection in particular um, and kind of what you're going to do to amend a sun care formulation, what considerations need to be made and some examples there. Um, then I'll be looking at sun care consumer research in particular. So how can we investigate these formulations with the consumers um, and get some feedback on the products and a little bit about claims substantiation as well. And I'll be sharing a case study to take you through that. Um, so make, uh, I'm going to go to you first actually so may god if you can introduce yourself um and let everyone know a little bit more about you yeah good morning everybody thank you again caris for this opportunity and i'm very proud to share and to help in another people to walk in this uh very difficult way when you talk about the sunscreen well i have around in 23 years four years experience in, in the uh, professional life feed and I had the opportunity to work around in six, 18 years in the international company for a long time in Johnson Johnson and Bias Dorothy uh, Nivea. Around um, four years ago, I had the opportunity to create the MW Innovation when you have the main folks to help the companies and the clients to always need to develop in a product. It started to help in a brief validation, concepting, work the bounty, pilot plant manufacture, and the last to help to the product in the business. And the, today, I think you'll have an opportunity to share. No give here exactly we need to do a perfect sunscreen. My objective here is just to share my feeling. What exactly I do when you go to the brand? What exactly have my mind when you need to develop a new product? And thank you so much for this opportunity again. Oh, thanks for coming, Macon, as well. And um, as Macon said, he's got a huge wealth of experience, but he's also on the other side of the world for us from Brazil. So we get some really good um, kind of global knowledge for you today. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the regulatory director at Aiton Global Research. So I'm really focused on the regulations surrounding advertising claims, um, but also product testing to make sure we're basically giving you the best study and questionnaire designs to support um, your formulation. So I think together, me and Mekon make a great team because we're going from the formulation side right to the testing. So to just give you an overview of why we're talking about sun care, um, why is it so important? Well, it's a huge market. Um, I think it's really one of those particular products um, that's come from being something people would only use kind of the going out in the sun, bit of sun protection. Um, and as you can see from Cosmetics Design Europe in this kind of excerpt I've taken, it's really gone beyond that. And it's now become a kind of daily product for people uh, to protect them against aging and um, pollution as well. Um, because as we know, the sun is not just about kind of getting burns and obviously protecting you from the really damaging rays, but it also can age the skin. Um, so we want to kind of avoid that as well. Uh, so it, it's really something, you know, most products you see on the market now have some form of SPF. Um, which really puts them into the kind of uh, sun care market as well. And I think that's only going to keep on happening. Um, and as it says here, it, it's just um, it, it's going to surge this kind of 7% growth, which is huge when you think of any industry um, over the next 10 years. So it, it's something that's really in demand with consumers. I also thought it was quite interesting um, 
from Mordor Intelligence as well to say this consumer awareness again people are more aware of the damaging rays and kind of how what they can cause but also there's been a real boom in natural and organic products um, in particular in the sun care market um, and again Macon will be mentioning sort of things about ingredients and stuff like that a little bit later on. I also want to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the sun care market um, because it is something that's been going on for over a year now um, that we can't really avoid uh, and it's obviously still having an impact not only to us as people but also to a lot of the um, kind of FMCG markets as well. Um, so COVID-19 did affect sun care, um, it is something, it's kind of coming out of it now but obviously especially in um, kind of countries where I am like the UK People don't tend to need to use sun care as much because there's hardly ever sunny. Um, so we did find that because people people weren't going abroad um, and getting away somewhere hot, there was quite a negative um, impact on it. Um, yeah. Although uh, it is something that people are resuming to travel and starting to socialize more, it's something that it will overcome because things will get back to normal. We were very positive, especially as I said over here, the vaccines are rolling out. We know that the sun care market is going to boom again. So this dip is really something that isn't going to last very long. Um, and again, we've sort of seen in other countries, uh, so in particular Asian countries, um, that there really wasn't a dip at all. So if you do have a global market or if you're looking to be global, um, th th there's obviously many countries that do have a you know really nice weather all the time. Um, so you do see kind of that need for it all the time. And again, people want to introduce it as daily products anyway. So it's still going to be a huge market either way. Um, so Macon, just let me know when you want me to click next, by the way, because uh, I'm kind of in control here and I'll do that. But yeah, if you can kind of start us off about the formulations, that'd be amazing. Yeah, this is very interesting. When you talk the business before the pandemic, the sunscreen category increased a lot. However, that last year you have a big, big impact in all countries, all companies. But to one point, a very interesting thing, if you look at the, the sunscreens all the time, this category increased a lot. I, I like to tell the this category is more uh, population, more disseminating for a lot of companies, the small, the medium, the big companies, so they have this internally technology. However, for consumers, it doesn't have a big penetration. Most important, the companies give more or put more money for education the population. If you look at today, doesn't doesn't have a big part of the population has this access the sunscreen. Example here in Brazil, very small population, because this is a technology very very expensive. Based on this, I have two points most important when you personal will working or working on sunscreens, most important having your mind. First point, you need to start studying a lot, learning. You need to look at what happened all the globally. Uh, around two, three years ago, when they starting this life, it doesn't have a big access or information today you have. In the past, you have all of the supply help you with the technological information. This is uh, just to uh, tell them they go to the slide, Carol. Just oh, yeah. to click. Okay, this is most important. Here, you the personal work in a sunscreen have this first point need to study every day because you know the the technology you have every day when a new technology, but special sunscreens you most important to understand what's happening outside your normal life. You need to look at the com com uh, consumers, the regulatory, it's uh, fast, it changed a lot, the competitor, but the, the most important thing, the message here, you need to have a good contact with the suppliers because this professional help us to develop, help us to working outside the box. And the second point, but the most important, Karen, just 
and then go belly on the back. I'm so sorry. The personal work in the sunscreen doesn't work in a work banding. It's a difficult to have a good success because this is a very particular technology because you have a lot of ish, a, a lot of interaction, a lot of uh, synergism but ingredient. And most important, go to test, test, test. Personal just to work in one or two samples, it tell, oh, I have a perfect sunscreen. Sorry, maybe you have a big mistake. Based on this, go next slide, please. This is pointy have in your mind. First point, you need to understand your main competitor. But look at your real competitor. Sometimes people talk to me, oh, Michael, I would like this product. This is amazing benchmark for me. I tell, OK, it's amazing benchmark. Uh, benchmark. But do you have money for this? Do you have equipment for this? This is the most important. Claim, sensorial position, you understand your competitor help you to develop your product. The second, look at the regular form. Today, uh, it's most important that you understand the country you work or you develop or you launch your product. Sometimes, today, normally people have one product you would like launching in different countries. Sorry. For sunscreen, you need to adaptation the regulatory filters, concentration filters, uh, and consumer sensorials. Just to hear two examples. Uh, in 2019, Brazil launched the RDC 288. This, this uh, direction had a big impact in, in all sunscreen cosmetics. When you need to show for Anvisa, the Brazilian regulatory, the dosation of ingredients. This is very interesting. Uh, based on this, uh, I had the opportunity to create a, a new extension MW innovation. And today you give this support. Why? Because it, this is a special technology. You need to help your client, your partner, the, to solve the issue of the dosation because have it impacted the process, have impacted the MEP. In another, uh, an example here is most important to look at. The last year had this new discussion about uh, homosalating. When today in uh, Europe I use 10% of homosalating, but this discussion about it, this just eruption in the document, blah, 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 need to decrease it for 1.5. Honestly, this concentration doesn't have an impact in the uh, formula. M this is interesting. You need to help in another countries. You need to understand what exactly your regulatory uh, uh, has in your product. Consumer, this is an important point and key for you to develop your sunscreen. Focus groups, we understand the happening, we understand your formula, we understand your ingredients. Based on this, you will have a perfect sensorial perfectly performance and you have, have, if possible, to create a good cost competition. And when you talk exactly point, you have one formula and need to replace me, this is a big challenge. Why? Sometimes the consumers know your formula. Sometimes the consumers love your formula. But the people told me, oh, this formula is expensive. You need to decrease the cost. Oh, without the CUT, it's difficult to have a success when you will go to replacement this formula. But this is one point. Next slide, please. This is one point interesting. I love sunscreen life because you have a mix in sunscreen life. It's just uh, you have a big challenge because you have a mathematical, chemistry, physical, biological. Uh, this is interesting because you created the balance, the balance of the ingredients, the performance sensorial, cost, stability, regulatory. This is a 
amazing. It's uh, interesting for us. Now I told you, without study alone, it's difficult to develop. If you just pick up one form and look, it's a better, oh, I liked it. When you go to the pilot plant or you go a uh, uh, manufacturer, certainly you will be have a big problem. Based on this, next slide, please. When you talk the sunscreen formulation, I like to use this combination. Think about it, uh, you have uh, 10 or 30 people in the same room and tell these people, okay, we will stay in this room for all the life. You need to live together, you, have, you, you need to have a very nice life. This is a sunscreen. You put in the same pack more 45 ingredients, different function, different interaction, different uh, uh, synergism, and tell them, oh, now you have a perfect life. Honestly, think about it, it's a difficult. It's the same as, I use this example association, the ingredient the sunscreen is the same as. We don't Without we understand the exactly function, the exactly interaction ingredients, is certainly you do not have a good uh, success or perfect formula. Next, please. Based on the uh, another point, this is sometimes when you talk as sunscreen, is normally you have two direction. I know today have a lot of direction, but I like to use this. When you create one category of recreational, it's more outside life, it's more free. When you bring more a friendly cosmetic, when you never talk a bad point to the sunscreen, it's another daily using sunscreen protection. This is a category crazy a lot because it has more opportunity to the companies to work in a different ingredient, different uh, cost is more easy, not easily, but more uh, in quick time, the consumer, if possible, look at the sunscreen benefits, okay? But the most important when you talk about the sunscreen, you never, never, never forget the first point, the main objective you develop sunscreen. The next slide, please. Is the same time is the people's forget. What exactly benefits? Why you need to develop a perfect and good uh, sunscreen for prevent the cancer? And Carrie, the last Tuesday you have the opportunity to see this new movie when Neutrogena's uh, student launching. This is a uh, people. If you work in sunscreen, need you to look at this movie. It's an amazing movie. Okay, I'm a suspected because I. I worked a, for a long time in a Johnson Johnson. I had the opportunity to work in a, a Neutrogena brand. But this brand, this movie shows for us a technical people why need to develop the sunscreens with a good quality and safety. Safety for consumer. This is the first point. This is one point very interesting. It's the first and the main uh, objective you need to develop a sunscreen for consumer. Sometimes the people forgot this, the, the, the main point is so forgot the people forget why need the sunscreen. Sometimes the, sometimes the companies or scientists focus more on sensorial, 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 uh, in put the protection, put the performance in the back. Next, please. This is one point difficult, our sunscreen life is not easy. Every day has a PR issue, every time it has a bad press. This example, uh, the last Martin uh, had one paper when to talk about the octoclean. Oh my God, when you receive the information, when you talk about bad ingredients, stop, you understand? Look if this information is real. Sometimes behind this communication have a business influence. But in that case, the AFCI 
sent this a very amazing letter tell, when you told about octoclane, when you told about the fixing this, uh, the octoclane, the secret about octoclane. In parallel, this more informal, you have this communication on Instagram. Because the, when you talk to technical people, sometimes it's, it's every time 99% the people will understand. But if the client, is the final consumer, doesn't understand it. Example, you have here in Brazil when a nutritional professional put in an Instagram doesn't use it, sunscreen with octoclane because you, you kill it, because you, you die. Oh my God. I talked with this nutritional, my responsibility to influence. I had this responsibility. You have this responsibility to tell the people doesn't have the correctly information. My message with this slide, you most important to work together. And again, you need to study, you need to learn if you, the information is true or not. Example, having a lot of discussion about refis. But when you look at one the study, the, the, the scientist uh, pick up the uh, bag class, uh, put the receipt in the clothes. Think about put the bag class in your hand. Think about, you, you die too. But when you, the normal consumer, look at this information, create a, a big, big mistake about information. But this is most important. When you look at the bad news, just be careful. Look, understand. Call for your supply. Remember, supply help us a lot about this. Then have your technology and know how about the ingredients. Okay. This is my message with this uh, slide. Okay. This is another point. According to this, sunscreen's life is not easy. Recently in Hawaii, it's not the official communication, but the people you know today in Hawaii, it's a prohibitive use the, uh, the uh, uh, OMC and bees of another tree because the killers they receive. And recently, based on this before article, before paper shows for you, Internally, Hawaii sent this new note about octoclane. This is difficult. Uh, every time I talk to my friends, uh, sunscreen friends, uh, sure. Uh, I'll, uh, every time I talk with my friends about this uh, moment, I don't know the future for sunscreen. Maybe in 10 years, you don't have a new technology or new ingredients for help us. First point, you sunscreens increased a lot the cost. And the main objective to help the consumers prevent the cancer. Maybe you don't help them. Just the people with a lot of money will be have money for buy the sunscreen. I don't know the future, but my feeling this is a Next year is a difficult to develop, develop the uh, good sunscreen, high performance and safety for consumers. Okay. The next, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Mikon. Um, I think it's it's a really good um, thing to bring up as well about how ingredients get really bad press. And it's something that we've been talking about a lot in the industry, I think, over the last year. And I think one of the, the kind of um, real worrying issues is when people, they don't want to use the ingredients because they have bad press. But then I think there is a kind of responsibility for brands to actually educate consumers and let them know why it's not bad instead of kind of not using it. And it's just, it's food for thought, um, I think, uh, for the industry as a whole. I think there's a lot that we can do to spread some more information straight to the consumers. Um, Cause I think the industry gets it. <laughs> I think we know not to use some um, kind of, uh, Kind of use that bad press but yeah definitely there, there's there's some way we can communicate with consumers here to make sure that we don't get um, unnecessary bad press for, for ingredients as well 
Um, but on that note, uh, so we're going to look at some consumer research now, um, kind of to look at how we can test products and get consumer feedback and stuff like that. Um, so exactly that, getting that insight from the consumers, this is a really good way of communicating with your consumers by testing your products, understanding them, and kind of making your marketing a two-way conversation, finding out what resonates with them and kind of giving it back to them is what we're looking at. Um, but it's also a way to substantiate claims to do with perception. So generally, uh, we are looking at in-use tests. So people will use the product themselves, um, usually at home, and review the product, uh, give their feedback, and answer online questionnaires about it. So when we're saying about perception claims, this is because we're looking at the volunteers assessing the benefits of the product, um, kind of just themselves, whereas clinical studies have obviously much more to do with having instrumental tests, uh, measuring things, um, and certainly in, when it comes to things like sun screen um, it would be very much measuring the SPF levels um, but we're actually looking so kind of past that point when you've had your SPF tested we're then saying I don't know if it's a claim like uh, the product absorbs easily into the skin it doesn't feel sticky this is the sort of thing that we'll be looking at in particular so you might need additional evidence and I think that's really important to put forward especially with sun cream and especially when we're thinking of safety um, it's always um, something that we look at, at a claim by claim basis and we can give you really good feedback there but it does reflect the actual conditions of the product in use. Um, so instead of it being performed in a laboratory, I kind of touched on it earlier when I was saying, particularly in the UK, um, people go on holiday to use sun protection and you're using it in the water, on the beach, um, everything like that. It gives you that real actual conditions um, of the products as well. Um, so there's some examples of the kind of claims that we'd be looking at as well. Uh, so things like people saying their skin felt protected. Did they feel like they could apply it? Um, did they, you can kind of tell when you put on sunscreen if you don't really feel very confident that it's doing much. Um, so usually we're looking, we have the protection factor, but do people feel confident when they're using it as well? Um, would they re recommend it? So usually we do things like claims for families for sunscreen, because you know, you have the whole family use it. Um, and also claims like non-sticky and non-greasy are quite common as well. So as well as claim substantiation, uh, other reasons why you might conduct consumer research is generally part of the new product development. As Macon says, test, test, test. Um, so that also includes your consumer. Find out how your product performs with them. You can review your formulations. You can benchmark against competitors and new formulations. Um, again, Macon made a really good point when people want to change the formulation, but the consumer likes it. Um, so we need to make sure those formulations are going to perform the same way. So there's all of these kinds of factors to it as well. And again, because we're getting them to assess it in actual use, if the consumers can't determine a significant difference between the products, that's really who matters at the end of the day when we're looking at you know, who's going to accept it. Um, so you can also investigate new markets. Um, that's a huge part of it. If you're currently selling a product in one and you want to see if people like it in a, in a new global market, obviously you want to get their feedback on it. You can also get things like testimonials and reviews and other marketing material like photos and videos as well, uh, which is a really good way to elevate your marketing, particularly on things like social media. Um, we like to see a lot of things like reviews and videos and things like that. Um, Karen, just oh, one point before I just talk uh, your preview slide. When you talk about packaging, this is very important point. And Sometimes the, the formulation on the R&D people just for focusing in formulation. I have a lot of experiences and bad experiences, experience, sorry. When you talk or when you forgot the packaging, package have a lot of influencing, not only performance, but the, about the sensorial, the consumer accepted the, the, your formulation or bad interaction. This is very, very important point. And sometimes uh, people doesn't forget the final objective you need this inspection. You need to expose a sun. This inspection, when you develop the inspection, we'll talk to water supply. Oh, this inspection for a sunscreen, you need to support in a sun, high temperature. People forgot it. Just one addition here about in my experience of this. Point is very, very uh, point two when you talk sunscreen. Because 
you have a lot of ingredients. You have a chemical ingredients. Sometimes these have a big interest in labeling, uh, removal or migration packaging. You do not have a, the packaging, special de packaging developed for sunscreen. Certainly, the consumer will be, be heavy the problem. I just have had a problem a little bit about the cap because the chemistry had interaction, the pack, the pack is uh, broken, the cracking. This is a point very interesting when you talk about the sunscreen. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, th thank you for making, <laughs> making me bring it up as well. Um, because yeah, packaging is a huge thing. So we generally test either, um, we're either looking at the packaging design or it can also be the branding as well. Um, so when we're doing claim substantiation tests, we're generally unbranded, but in the packaging we want, because it's so important to get that feedback, as you say. Um, but then we can also do branded tests as well, uh, which will look at, you know, things like with the labeling, um, does that attract the consumer? Do they like those claims on there? Does the color go with it? Does the name go with the product? Um, that there is so much that we can review this. I think that's a huge thing with consumer research. It allows you to review everything right from the packaging to the product performance itself um, and really get that insight from your consumers um, as well as kind of, I think I, the reason I'd bring it up is because people often go straight down claim substantiation. That's what we care about, get our claims substantiated. But you're missing this huge overall picture of everything you can get from it. Um, so yeah, it, it is a, a really great way to get that feedback for your development. Um, but I will focus on claim substantiation for this slide. Um, so we've got like kind of examples of claims that you would see online. Um, so, well, really anywhere to be fair with marketing, but these are some claims that I've got off people's websites, um, which show kind of some evidence in there as well, just to give you some ideas of what kind of thing we're looking at when testing sunscreen. Um, so the first one is the Ombre Solaire UV water, which is kind of down that clinical and safety route, as I mentioned earlier. So things about protection, by um, AVA and AVB rays, we need to make sure we're pro completely protected against UV rays. Um, it's got a two degree, minus two degrees Celsius skin cooling effect. So that has to be some kind of clinical testing there to prove it. And hydration for up to 24 hours. And because we've got a measurement of time there, um, that could be done by consumer claim because it's saying up to 24 hours, but generally if we're looking at kind of putting a timestamp on it, you get some kind of clinical testing to prove that the hydration in the skin is there kind of from the beginning to the 24 hours. Um, but then also I've got some results here from consumer tests. So Clarence have got um, some uh, sort of satisfaction tests on their, on their website for their um, SPF face cream. So people are saying that the skin's hydrated, comfortable, plumped and refreshed. This is what I was mentioning earlier, that daily protection has got SPF in it, but it's become much more than that. Um, and it's the same with uh, Drunk Elephant. They've got their consumer testing for their SPF, daily defense cream. Um, so obviously we're looking at protecting the skin, but also we want to make sure that it's non-irritating, the skin feels protected, soft and smooth, hydrated, and that it has a healthy glow. Um, so it gives you some really good examples there from, we've got this on a safety side, the clinical side, but we've also got that satisfaction side because it's a competitive market out there. And it's not really yeah. enough now just to say it's an SPF 30. Um, why should we use yours? What else does it do to my skin? Does it give me a nice healthy looking glow? Does it feel all smooth and hydrated? That's what people are really looking for. Yeah, just to carry just one addition, one point in my, uh, when you talk about it is the uh, Celsius, uh, Celsius decrease the sensation. I had a very interesting experience in my life. A long time ago, you had the one project, you have this objective. Oh, you need to develop your one product, you want the consumer apply the screen, had their cooling sensation. Okay, I pick up the special ingredient, Push it, put in the formula, all the people loved it, but the people use it in a regular life, normal life, in their own life. When the eye go to the pool and they apply the, the product in my skin, oh my God, I had a bad sensation. The, my skin my, had a big, bag, big freezer in my skin. <laughs> this is one point, most important, you understand it, exactly you put in your formula, exactly benefits. Because in that case, if you're using a, for a sport, 
outside for run, it's perfect product. But you need to think when the consumer apply the body and go to the beat. Yeah. It's very yeah. uncomfortable sensation. This is most important thing. You need to test, you need to check the exactly benefit, benefit you need to bring for a consumer or bring the, uh, the brand or bring the company. Yeah, so the formulation worked really well, <laughs> but it was the brand yeah. <laughs> didn't know where to where to market it. But again, that that's the huge part. Who who actually wants it? And it really is that cycle we we're discussing at the kind of towards the beginning, where it's it's you always need to think about where who's actually using the product as well as everything else. Um, because mm -hmm. it's amazing you can make these formulations, but you need to be giving it to the right people, otherwise it won't sell. Um, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go through a case study now of a consumer test um, to give you some idea, an idea of you know, how we design that kind of study and, and how we can substantiate some claims. Um, so this is for a kid's um, SPF spray um, by a pharmacy and kind of retailer we work with. Uh, so what was important here is it had to be families that tested it because obviously we can't ask children to test a product and kind of get their opinions. We want to get a whole family's opinion and see what parents think of the, of the product with their children as well. Um, and generally, if things are aimed at kids, when it comes to sun protection, we're looking at the whole family as well. Um, so we were looking at Australia. Um, it's a new market for the consumer, for, for the client, sorry. Um, so we wanted to make sure that it was going to work in that um, temperature, that climate, um, and that it'd be accepted by those consumers um, and really make sure that it is going to be easy to use and have long lasting protection because it's for kids. So the study was conducted in Australia. Um, we had a two week study. So obviously gives people enough time to use it several times and really give a good review. It was nice and simple in terms of we wanted all skin types. This had to be available for everyone. Um, because again, if you're looking at different age ranges, you're going to have different skin types. Um, and again, all age ranges. So specifically families that have children. Um, so we can get some feedback there. So once we kind of conducted the study, uh, we get a report at the end, which obviously people have reviewed themselves, they've viewed the product and they've answered these online questionnaires. Um, so then we get this feedback of the claims, um, so the statements that we're looking to assess, and then the number of people that agree with them. So we've got the number of people that had a satisfied response, the number of people that weren't satisfied, and then the percentage of people that were satisfied and not satisfied. As you can see with this product, a very small amount of people were unsatisfied. It did incredibly well. These are fantastic results. Um, so the kinds of product, the kind of claims that we've got here, this is just a snippet of you know the overall claims. Um, but things about the product being easy to apply and absorbing easily. Again, this is really important for sun protection. And then things that the user um, really wants to have an experience with as well. So not leaving white marks. That's really important because you're usually wearing clothes with it. Um, being kind of water resistant, so feeling like it's still on your skin after you've gone for a swim. Obviously, we apply sun cream anyway, but we want to make sure that we're getting that feedback. And then also making sure that it's preventing the skin from peeling. So it's basically moisturizing it. So when people would use it and after the day, if they felt like their skin wasn't peeling or anything like that, that's really good feedback. Um, so yeah, this had did really, really well, this, um, this product. Uh, so it's great for their marketing because, again, if you see all of these claims on a product that's for kids, it's going to make you really want to purchase it. So back to you, Maycon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you talk about uh, the claim, is, this is a big challenge for us, the, the sunscreen. What exactly are you using? What exactly are you putting in my package? What the perfectly... Uh, communication with the consumer. This is key point. The most important to look at the exactly messaging you need to uh, give for consumer because this is a terrible today. And to, in a short time in Brazil, in have a new law about the labeling. When you, in next November, if you put, if most, if you necessary to put in the Portuguese, in the English, ENC, ink name in the back label. You do not have more area for put the claims. But what exactly you communication for a consumer? Blue, blue, clean, bio. This is 
point in interesting. You need to understand your consumer. You need to understand exactly this consumer need. Uh, if possible, use the consumer test. If you possible, to look at the competitor. But uh, today, what exactly claim you, you put in my packaging? This is a, a very difficult for us because it, you have a lot of direction. You know, safety, performance, feeling, uh, sensorial, or, or safety the planet. This is another challenge for us, the sunscreen, because the sunscreen is a different uh, technology. When you compare another products, I like to use the parliament. When the, the top of this parliament is, you have the sunscreen, it's more difficult. You need to provide, you need to bring the effect, efficacy. Example, if you develop a moisturization product, if you, the, the consumer doesn't like the moisturization, doesn't like the consume, the, the fragrance, okay. The consumer just a little upset because they, uh, they lost the, the money. But it's sunscreens, no. Sunscreens, if you possible, stop the vacation or create the burning or create the problem in the skin. The most important here, you need to study, study, and go to the bent, bent, bent. Without these two ways, impossible developing a perfect or nice or friendly sunscreen. Great. <laughs> and, and my key message here, all the presentation told. First, the quality people. You need to look at the quality, not only the product, only the process, the packaging, the influence. Example, you know what's happened in your product about the thought stability. If you put your product in the sun, you have this stability, your packaging. Your packaging had the stability when the exposure in the sun or not. And second, safety. Safety for consumer, it's most important. This is a key message when you work, not only sunscreen, but all the products, but the special the sunscreens, this is a key message. And the next, please. This is our real life in the sunscreen. It's not easy, it's a difficult. The people tell, oh, sunscreen is easy, it's had a big mistake because you have a science, science behind the sunscreen. But I love you, I stay here for help. It is a difficult, but uh, I like this challenge every day. And the carries. thank you so much again for this opportunity. Share a little my uh, my mind about uh, the the sunscreen reformulation or new sunscreen. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really, really amazing to get all of your insights um, because you know we're just the testing side, so the formulation side is always really interesting. Um, so we're going to answer some questions now. I've seen lots of people have been flagging up notifications. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have a little look through now and uh, kind of see what we've got. Um, so I'm going to go on the chat first and I'll go to the question and answers to see um, what people are saying. So yeah, firstly, we will be sharing um, the, the, the recording afterwards as well. So that'll be going out. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a question from Ravi. So how many consumers participate in these type of studies, which is statistically valid to make the claims? So this is a, a very good question. And unfortunately, there's never any straight answer here. Um, so we do need to make sure they're statistically valid. It depends on the type of test, um, and it depends on the product, and it depends on the claim. Generally, for consumer studies, we recommend about 100 responses. It really can depend, though, um, and especially if we're looking at things like lots of different skin types, if we're looking at any splits, we have to make sure that not only is the overall data statistically valid, but also that all the subgroups are as well. Um, so I think I always say aim for 100 um, just to give you a ballpark figure, but it may always change. And then again, it's very different when it comes to safety testing. That is usually a much smaller panel. Um, yeah, there's no straight up answer. Um, <laughs> But if you ever have a project in particular and you know your markets, you know what claims you want to substantiate, we can give you a really good design based on that. 
That, that's always a question that comes up every webinar. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, interesting, Carlos. Uh, I know I have a lot of experience about these consumer panels. Sometimes the, the, the people use the clinical test for conducting this uh, consumer performance. I'm very uh, afraid about this because sometimes create the uh, bad or not good or real direction. Because when you talk about the consumer, you need to look the exactly consumer, the habit. You need to have the perfect screen in the consumer panel. I had the recently the, uh, experience about this. The, the partner, she told me, oh, Michael, I have this consumer testing and I use the clinical. However, the real consumer doesn't like the product. When you look at the, the study test, the study is first, the panel consumer doesn't use the sunscreen. What, what is possible use pick up the influence or uh, needs or feedback the consumer but this consumer doesn't use it, the sunscreen. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Yeah. Based on this, is most important. They created the exactly panel, exactly consumer you need to pick up the information. This is most important. Absolutely. We, we often, like, we've got partners that will conduct consumer studies, uh, clinical studies, sorry, because obviously we don't have the, the labs to do it. We, we focus on the consumers themselves, but we pair it up because that objective claim you might get, like I said, something like 24-hour hydration, we'll do a clinical study for that. But then we want to get 100 consumers to agree with everything else on that um, and get their feedback. And it's true. I mean, often clinical labs do sort of say they'll do consumers as part of it. But A, it's it's not a real reflection of the product in use. And B, no. it's much smaller because they tend to do tests on sort of 40 or 50 people. When you're looking at subjective claims, which are consumer claims, they are people's opinion. It's not enough um, to say if everyone's going to have that opinion. So we need a larger panel base. Um, so generally, I mean, that's the thing with consumer studies still much cheaper, even though we need many more products because we're not coming into a lab. Um, and clinical studies are much more expensive with the instrumental studies, but having that kind of co collaboration of both is, is a really good way to get great evidence, um, not only just to get your claims substantiated, but to understand your market. It's, they marry up well. <laughs> uh, so we've got another mm -hmm. question here uh, to say, do you believe collaboration with end consumers is a new way of product development in order to target the real need of the group? Um, I don't think it's new. I think, I think it is. Um, it's definitely um, the the best way to review it. So as I was saying, it, it becomes a two way conversation. We work with a lot of brands that, at the same time of doing their product tests, use it as an opportunity to find out what claims actually resonate with their consumer, so they can understand the language they need to use. Um, it can be something. It's not always just one test as well. So sometimes we do just an online survey and find out the claims. We do like a claim screener, we call it. So see which claims resonate and then do the product test um, based on it. And we kind of use that formulation or you can do it all together. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great way to develop products. Uh, so many, as it, it really does, I guess it depends on budget a lot of the time, you know, the bigger companies can afford to test and test and test. Um, but certainly even if you're a smaller brand, utilize um, the opportunity because you will find that actually you're saving money in the long run because you'll understand your consumer, you'll understand your market and you'll get to kind of have this conversation with them to really to really develop the product as best as you can. Uh, so I've got another, um, another question as well here. Um, so I'll get your feedback on this one as well, Makon. So how do we educate the end consumer against public nonsense and non-scientific rumors? It's a very good question. <laughs> Yes, yes, because when you talk about this, you talk about the technology. The most important use the more simple uh, words for the co normal consumer. My suggestion here, you have a good interaction with your supply. You had a good uh, meeting and the supplies help you about this, but you need to choose the simple or normally words for no, consumers will understand. But is it difficult? No. 
when you have a bad news in quick time, a lot of people saw this information. But we, a scientist, I have even a big friend, is Albert Cage. Uh, I learned a lot about Albert Cage and use the Albert Cage words. Uh, the scientists, you have to work together. The scientists have the to uh, influence. The scientists need to help the community. Uh, I stop it when you have a bad communication. It's true. But sometimes the people, sometimes the scientists just stop uh, in the moment very upset, but never put in the face and talk, no, stop it, this is not correctly. No, doesn't share this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is kind of what I was mentioning. I think a lot of brands, like I said, instead of saying to the consumer that actually that's not true, they'll just go along with it because they don't want to be seen to be using ingredients that have bad press. And, and I think that's it. I think it, that's, you know, it's just my opinion. But the bigger brands that have the platforms, if they could be on the side of the scientists and the formulators, um, and kind of put that out there, it, it would be so amazing for our industry. And I think that's it. We have a very small following and I'll shout it as loud as I can. <laughs> but yeah, so but it, it, yes, this that is one point. You just see the, you have it, the union, the big company, the governmental, uh, you need to work together. Not, not only one company, but the, it's a no, it's a difficulty. But when you have it as a rumor, you need to governmental influence it too. You need to support or the institute or the groups. Uh, you need to work together. Yeah. Absolutely. Just to send the uh, Q, uh, community message, the chemistry example here in Brazil have the ABC, Association Brazilian Cosmetics. Normally, or Abbey Packing, normally when you have these big rumors, this association send the letter or put in the magazine to help the consumer. But it's not only you need to work together for stopping this bad news, no? Yeah, I think, I, to be fair, I think that the European Union are pretty good. So I know a lot of you know that we had a, a real crackdown in the, in the cosmetics regulations about using things like free from claims. And yeah. I think that that's what we need is we need the support from the regulation itself, because if they can stop misleading claims happening, that's, that's exactly what we need. But I think that that's it. If, if everyone comes together, it makes the regulations change because the whole industry is, is kind of upset about it. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's an interesting thing for us to all to think about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've got a question for you, Macon, um, from Ricardo, um, asking about the new UV, UV filters dosage required by Brazilian law. What is more difficult to dosage, organic or inorganic UV absorbers? The combination of them make the dosage still more difficult and complicated, or does it? Thank you, Ricardo, for this uh, question, my best friend. It's first, the RDC, because it's not clear. The first is this RDC, the regulation 28080, is not the, totally clear. You have just one topic, just to put the dosation about the sunscreen. However, when you send the the documentation for Anvisa, you receive a lot of questions. The first, the problem today, you do not have a resolution, a clear resolution. The second point, when you talk more a methodology, first, you need to have in the lab a robust methodology for quantification, analytical methodology. You need behind the personals of people who understand it the sunscreen on the ingredient. Uh, according to Odin, uh, in 2019, I saw a lot of people had this problem for a dosation. And I had the, the idea, together my friend Jose Merdias had more 30 years in experience in analytical. Together, today you help the companies, the, the partnership or clients to solve the issues. Because sometimes you have the issues in a formulation. Sometimes it doesn't have the people normally use the same equipment for uh, 
skincare for a cleanser product for a sunscreen. Sorry, people. You need the special equipment for formulation sunscreen. This is not a normal creamy. Normally, when you have a difficulty for this, had these issues about the process, manipulation, the GMP, or uh, the packaging, the put the, the product in no in a special packaging, the packaging is closed. You have a lot of difficult behind. Sunscreen is difficult, no? When you created this uh, uh, regulamentation, uh, shows for the company, stop it. Do you conduct it? Do you have a perfect process for your sunscreen? This is my key point. I know a lot of people in this moment had a lot of many issues because it's, first, it's ex expensive. It's a different when you compare the SPF, you told me. Today, the people know developing SPF. Now, people need to understand it what exactly need to do for had the good the sunscreen dosation or had a good performance when you talk about this. Miss, thank you for uh, the question. Hmm. Thanks, Michael. Um, and I've got, well, I'll do one last question uh, before we finish because I'm aware we're nearly at an hour. Um, so just another question from David to say, can you speak about the different sun filters and the impact on consumer acceptability? So those in Brazil love Minasol, for example, and then others in the EU are lighter and more, more acceptable. So especially for skin color. So from my side, I would say that we always test products in the key markets. Um, so obviously, as you said, there is going to be different products that are accepted in different countries and different preferences. And especially, like I said, we're looking at things like skin color we have to be really um, mindful of that. So we always find out what our clients' key markets are before we do the test, and that's where we're testing it. It's another good point about consumer research is that what, that's what you're going to do. Um, but if you have a global market, we'll, we'll select the key markets around the globe. You know, wouldn't it test in every single country? That would be crazy. Um, but we might select kind of a few different markets and test there. And that would give you that chance to get that feedback and see what is being accepted there. Um, but absolutely, it, it, it will depend on the country. Um, it will depend on the consumers that kind of in, prefer different different products there as well. Karen, just to add some information, uh, I had the opportunity to, to work in the first Minnesol developing in Brazil. I had the responsibility for uh, the project that was developing the Minnesol active soya and oil control. And correctly, Firstly, you have a big difference in the sunscreens, the, uh, disposable, sunscreens available for developing the product. You know the FDA have a lot of, it doesn't have the approval, many ingredients. First of all, you need to look at the uh, region, the humidity, you need to look at the skin consumer. Uh, a lot of people love the Minisol but you working for more three years for developing one formally exactly for Brazilian skin. And sure, if you pick up the product in Europe and use it in a Brazilian on Australia, you, you have a, a greasy sensation. Yeah. This is a big point. You need to understand it not only the consumer, but the external influence, the humidity, the consumer, the skin. This is uh, uh, it's true. This is most important. Of course, in, in Europe and in America, you have a disposed, uh, assessed different ingredients, different ingredients. If you put to different sunscreen, sorry. Uh, if you possible, develop a high SPF with low concentration, the sunscreen. This influencing directly the sensorial, the greasy, the spreadability. But it is true. According to Toby, if you develop for Australia, develop the consumer or the habit of Australia. If you develop it for Europe, you need to understand this. Mm. Yeah, understand. Uh, sometimes people would like the globally formula. Yeah. I know the, the cost, but it's 
certainly if if certainly you you have issues about the sensorial and another point you know if you develop the sunscreen for north and you and they apply the same sunscreens in south and the globally the planet you have a different aspect this is another point you need to test the spf when you you selling when you have your blended sunscreen yeah I think the, the first the first step is always where are you selling the product? <laughs> always think about that first. <laughs> and everything else will definitely fall into place. Well, thank you very much for answering all those questions as well, Mako. And so I'm just gonna round up the webinar now. Um, so I firstly just want to let you know of some other webinars that I have coming up. And funnily enough, talking about different markets and things like that. I'll be joined by um, Karim Girani from Cult Beauty next week, um, or the week after. I try to think what the date is. Next week, <laughs> next week on the 7th of May, uh, where we'll be talking about global expansion. So again, knowing what your market is, because from a logistics point of view, we'll be looking at actually how you're going to get your product into those countries. And we'll kind of focus on Brexit in particular as well. Uh, then on the 21st of May, I'll be hosting a webinar for about um, supplements in particular. Um, so I have hosted this webinar before and we'll be looking at it again as supplements get ever more complex in regulations and we get more claims. And then on the 28th of May, I'll be joined by Thomas Marquardt, where we'll be looking at um, a market research study we're conducting, looking at consumer insights uh, for cosmetics use uh, before, during and after COVID. Um, I also want to point your attention in the direction of the SCS. Um, so they have a distance learning course, which is a recognized course in the essentials of cosmetic science that you can do at any time, anywhere in the world. So if that's something you find interesting, do look at their website. We'll also be sponsoring the IFSCC Congress, um, which will be in September 2022. Um, so please do register your interest for that now as well. So thank you so much again for joining Macon. It's been fantastic to have you join me and talk all about formulation yeah, um, i've got both of our contact information there but i will be sending out the contact information to you all directly um, when i send out the recording shortly this afternoon um, so thank you all for joining and listening um, and your amazing questions as well it's been fantastic uh, and i hope you all have a fantastic weekend thank you thank again you. and have a nice weekend <laughs>